um, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, um, I've been enjoying all the talks uh, so far. Um, uh, you know, Lance's ta uh, panel was, you know, all about mentorship. Um, so what I'll be talking about specifically is, uh, you know, of course, mentorship, but I guess Sugar Labs's uh, unique um, approach to mentorship. Um, and I'm going to do it through the lens of, uh, you know, some some people that have gone, you know, that are associated with Sugar Labs, um, and you'll get to know them a little bit more um, through this talk. This uh, presentation um, needs a little bit of explanation. Um, we have a tradition <laughs> at Sugar Labs of coding our own presentations um, using the tools that we build. Um, so this is Music Blocks. And uh, so this is, uh, of course, free software, um, but it's not like, uh, you know, LibreOffice. Um, of course, it's not PowerPoint. Um, you know, uh, doing, uh, you know, slideshow presentation is a powerful tool. It's a powerful idea. Um, and, uh, you know, we encourage, um, you know, teachers, learners um, to, you know, engage in powerful ideas, you know, remix them. And uh, so this has one feature that a typical uh, slideshow presentation would not have. And this is where I need to explain it. And this will require a little bit of uh, participation on your part. <laughs> um, so uh, in order to advance to the next slide, you have to answer a question. <laughs> So it will quiz you um, whether it's uh, do, re, or me, okay? And uh, so if you want to indicate that you think it's do, um, you can put up one finger. Um, re, you could do two fingers. And then me, you can put up three fingers. Um, we'll uh, do a little test run first, and I'll, I'll input it. Um, so here we go. So you put up your hand, do you think it's one, two, or three? You'll get the hang of this by the end of it. So it's the second pitch you want to be concentrating on. So I'll put in Ray, because I, I think it's two. There we go. Um, OK, so I guess I should have done one wrong so you see what happens. It, it, it won't let you go forward. Um, so this is a, a photo I took, um, you know, just uh, outside. Um, what do you think it is, by the way? Here, I, someone said uh, two, so I'm going to put uh, Ray in. Not two. <laughs> there we go. OK, so uh, mentoring youth, the FOSS strategy we've been looking for. OK, so if we're going to do this, uh, we're going to talk about uh, four individuals that have been involved in, in Sugar Labs. Uh, one uh, is Nathan. Um, uh, one is, his name is India, Anindya, um, um, Emily, and Ibium. Come on, you, there's no wrong answers. I mean. <laughs> The camera's not on you. <laughs> um, so this is uh, my student, uh, Nathan, um, uh, quite a while ago. I'm looking at this photo. So this photo was taken at Libre Learn Lab. And uh, uh, Mariah's here, who uh, 
you know, basically organized this. Uh, it happened um, this year that it happened was in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I invited some of my students. Um, Nathan is on the left in the yellow shirt. Um, uh, one of my other students is uh, the one right in, in front of the computer. And then Cynthia Solomon, who's uh, uh, one of the co-authors of the Logo programming language, is uh, the one um, standing behind uh, both those boys um, looking at what they created on the computer. Um, and that day they were doing a Music Blocks uh, uh, workshop. Um, fast forward. Um, um, this is Nathan just uh, last week, just a few days ago. Um, so um, what was his journey like? So, you know, Nathan um, was using uh, well, first he started as a student of mine um, learning guitar um, about eight years ago, um, probably like just you know a few months or so before that picture was taken. Um, then uh, he learned uh, piano with another teacher. Um, he still uh, studies guitar with me. Um, and then he studied uh, music blocks, um, which is one of the visual programming languages that Sugar Labs um, curates. Um, that I co-authored along with Walter Bender um, for teaching kids uh, programming and musical concepts, for exploring, you know, um, a lot of uh, great ideas. Um, and uh, what he's doing in this picture is he's uh, contributing now to the development of Music Blocks itself. Um, he was, uh, you know, writing up bug reports, um, we set up like a development environment, and he was, uh, you know, learning Git, um, he was checking out different branches, um, he was, he's also uh, been making lesson plans uh, for teachers to use, um, and he's actually doing a really good job of it. Um, so he's 14 years old now, um, so I'm very proud of, uh, you know, of how his journey is going so far. Um, and he does it with grace. Um, it, um, he uh, is just really awesome. Um, so let's go on to the, the next person in our, our story. Get in the hang of this? Yeah. <laughs> We were wrong. Okay, now now it's it's what we thought it was. <laughs> okay, so this is Anindia. So Anindia came with to us um, to participate in Google Summer of Code um, this year. Um, we have um, fourteen interns um, that we're mentoring uh, through Google Summer of Code. Um, he started in twenty twenty. Um, and uh, he uh, is quite incredible. Um, at the at the end of his internship, um, he decided to uh, make an entirely new version of one of the projects that we've uh, been working on. So um, he basically has, uh, within just a few years, become a project lead, um, and. Uh, Last year and this year, he's been a mentor to other uh, Google Summer of Code students, um, and just recently, you know, you know, gave, uh, you know, a, you know, shared um, his journey um, in a in a video interview um, to help others, you know, who are interested in participating in, uh, you know, Google Summer of Code or just in general with, you know, Sugar Labs development um, and uh, he uh, is finishing his uh, his masters um, he is uh, also you know working um, at uh, various companies um, it's uh, quite incredible what, what he's doing Do. <laughs> okay. 
Um, Emily, uh, so um, I've told a few people here this, but I'm really sad um, that we don't have Google Code in anymore. Um, we participated in Google Code in for a few years. Um, Google, if you're not familiar with Google Code in, um, it was similar to Google Summer of Code, um, where you'd have youth uh, work on on different free software projects. Um, but this was mainly targeted at ages uh, 14 through 17, um, or maybe it was 13 through 17. Um, Emily, I believe at this time was uh, 14 years old and uh, she didn't have a lot of coding experience, um, but uh, she uh, has made a lasting contribution. <laughs> um, and uh, so the, the mouse that is in music blocks, and I can show you it later, uh, you know, she designed it and you can see the progression of it <laughs> um, in this blog post that she created. Um, and uh, we still use it to this day. So it's exactly the same way as uh, she created it like uh, six or seven years ago. Um, Ibium um, is uh, really interesting. So um, Ibium started with uh, one laptop per child. Um, so um, he was, uh, and still is, living in Nigeria. Uh, he was living in Nigeria at the time that uh, they brought the old PC, the one laptop per child computer, which runs uh, the Sugar desktop environment on it. Um, and uh, I just interviewed him like a, a month ago, um, and he told his whole story about he got, how he got started. Um, so he got one of these laptops. Um, he thought it was just incredible, all the, the different things he could do with it. You know, a few times he stayed up all night with friends, you know, hacking on it. Um, he thought that the fact that you could, you know, with the push of a button, see the source code was, you know, really a novel thing because that's a feature of the Sugar desktop environment. You can press a button and whatever application you're, you're using, um, you can uh, see the source code for that application. Um, and that helped him in turn learn, you know, more about programming. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, now he's one of the maintainers for um, a lot of the, the packages for, uh, for Sugar. Um, so definitely a success story um, as well. So many, many more success stories, but I had to kind of focus on just a few. Yes. Okay, so what do these uh, individuals all have in common? Um, so, um, so one thing is each one of these individuals is not only using free software, um, you know, but you know, contributing to free software. Um, each person, you know, here uh, has been mentored um, and continues to receive uh, support from our community um, toward their own personal growth. Um, you know, each uh, of these people um, has had, you know, agency within the community, um, you know, is, is, you know, able to be heard um, and, uh, you know, uh, kind of affect the, the course of, of the direction that we go in. Um, and each person is learning by doing. So um, they're working on meaningful projects, um, you know, not just kind of like trying, like solving already solved problems. Um, you know, for example, like we actually needed that, you know, that mouse image, <laughs> you know, um, and that's why we still use it today. So, you know, it might've seemed like a small thing, um, but, you know, it was a very important thing. And now, you know, Emily has that, you know, something to point to, um, you know, that's her contribution you know, and it's a lasting contribution because it is something that we actually needed. Got it right away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so um, what's different about uh, the stories of these individuals? Um, you know, everybody came in from uh, different entry points. Um, so, you know, no two people are alike. Um, you know, in India, for example, you know, did not use, you know, the sugar desktop environment or any of the activities, you know, when, when he was growing up, um, but came in through Google Summer of Code, Ibium, you know, received one, you know, the one laptop per child computer. Uh, you know, Nathan came in through it, uh, you know, through his teacher, through myself. Um, Emily came in through Google Code. And so there's like, you know, people come, you know, to uh, software, you know, pedagogy to uh, from all sorts of different uh, walks of life. Got it. Um, okay, so how did I get into in, involved in Sugar Labs and myself? Um, so, uh, you know, um, I mean, I first I, I became really frustrated with my computer, which at that time was a Mac. Uh, computer um, and uh, I asked myself a simple question you know like why is my computer telling me what to do <laughs> um, and uh, at that time I didn't know that there was any other option um, but then um, I did spend some time and I did some research and I discovered free software um, mainly on the fsf.org and gnu.org pages um, and at that time, I was um, taking a class uh, called Music in Education, or yes, a suite of classes called Music in Education. We were always asking the question, what are the implications for X in music education, or like whatever it was. Um, and uh, so when I discovered free software, it was easy to plug in that into that X. You know, what are the implications for free software in music education? education obviously but also um, education in general and my conclusion was there are profound implications for education here i mean you know i think that the the freedom to study the source code that just seems like such a no-brainer to me um that i'm surprised that it's not more you know uh you know advocated by more educators um and uh you know but not just that, um, but you know, the freedom to to remix the source code because, like, how do you really know something unless you spend some time, uh, you know, playing around with it, you know, making it your own? Um, so, you know, for these reasons, um, you know, I wanted, but at that time it was mainly theoretical. So, you know, it's like theoretically, you know. Free software has profound implications for education, um, but um, and I was lucky enough that uh, Walter Bender, the one of the co-founders of One Laptop Per Child and Sugar Labs, was giving a talk um, because I did, you know, in the course of my research, you know, discover Sugar Labs, and I was like, wow, you know, um, in my mind, you know, this is. Uh, you know, theoretically very sound, you know, that, you know, people would learn uh, if they have the, the freedom to, you know, study the source code, share it, you know. Um, but um, I hadn't seen, you know, very many people actually, you know, applying those freedoms to uh, teaching and learning um, other than Sugar Labs. And so I wanted to see his talk. Um, and I saw his talk, and you know, one of the things that really struck me is he was mentioning that, you know, when they started, there was like nearly zero students, uh, you know, working on the code base itself. Um, but there was a, a point that they reached where 50% of the contributions um, to, you know, the Sugar Desktop environment and the various activities were uh, were made by the students themselves. And I was like, there, there it is, you know. <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know, the proof of the theory.
Um, yeah, so this is, uh, you know, I, I put this slide up here. Um, I've given uh, talks, you know, um, on what I call a tale of two classrooms. Um, I even wrote an, an article in the Free Software Foundation Bulletin about this. Um, um, it's, uh, you know, basically what I just said. But on the left, you see, you know, if you can imagine in a, in a typical classroom where they're, they're using proprietary software, someone raises their hand, it's like, how does this work? You know, the, the teacher can only like shrug and say like, you know, I don't really know and there's not really a great way to find an answer. I mean, you can observe like how it works, you know, just by seeing the surface. Um, whereas in a free software classroom where, you know, the, the tooling is free software, it's like a curious student can raise their hand and say like, I wonder how this works and perhaps the, you know, the teacher doesn't know um, exactly, but uh, the teacher can say, well, you know, the source code is available, you know, and there's a group of developers and you can become part of the community, you know. So um, um, in my mind, that's the ideal classroom. And, uh, you know, at Sugar Labs, that's basically what we have all online. That's one way to to put it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Bravo. Wow. <laughs> you passed the test. Um, yeah. And so, you know, this is this is a free software classroom right here. You know, everyone's using <laughs> one laptop per child laptop, um, which is running the Sugar desktop environment. Um, you know, um, this is kind of an older photo but you know I've traveled the world and and many of these uh, computers are still used around the world um, uh, at one of the classrooms I'm in charge of you know they're not these little green laptops but we do have you know some uh, you know think pads that are running you know well running Triskel mainly <laughs> and and Triskel has a version that sugar on it. You want to say incense? Yeah. <laughs> One, two, or three, everyone. Yes. You could you could not ask Microsoft for this feature, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, so um, what's uh, one of the other uh, main components of our approach? So um, uh, you saw Cynthia Solomon in one of the, the first slides. Um, uh, she and uh, Seymour Papert um, are the co-creators of the Logo programming language. Um, and Seymour Papert in particular, if I'm not mistaken, you know, spearheaded um, this idea of constructionism. So what is constructionism? Um, you can think of it as learn, learning by doing. Um, uh, so... If you think of, you know, um, let's call it instructionism as the idea that, you know, knowledge is transferred, you know, from one individual through a, to another, um, uh, constructionism is the idea that, you know, rather than, you know, being transferred one, from one person to another, um, it is uh, constructed, you know, by the student. So... Um, it's like, yeah, you can watch a lecture, you know, you can watch, you know, music blocks running on here. Um, but you know, the, the one way to like really learn how it works is to, you know, create programs in it. You know, the way to learn, you know, JavaScript or Python or whatever is to, you know, to actually make some, some programs. And I think that was one of the things, um, that, um, I thought was really great about, you know, the, the panel that Lance did um, where, you know, um, everyone in that program was talking about how, you know, their learning moment was, you know, when, you know, they had to, uh, you know, solve a, a meaningful problem, a difficult problem. 
And uh, at Sugar Labs, we, you know, um, we've got a lot of issues. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, we guide people through, you know, how to solve those, those issues. Got it. <laughs> Um, yeah, so there's many different levels to this. I mean, one is, uh, so, um, I was just at actually a constructionism conference. Um, so this is a conference of, of instructors that are really passionate about, you know, project-based learning, um, constructionism in particular. And it struck me that, you know, one, you know, actually the organizer was kind of lamenting that, you know, uh, a lot of students and teachers will show him a Scratch project, which is another visual programming language. And he's like, you know, show me a Scratch project that has not, that I haven't seen before. <laughs> um, and I was like, hmm, that's really interesting because in, you know, in music blocks and, uh, you know, for example, there's, uh, I don't know. I mean, I came up with a list just the other day. Just it took me like ten minutes to do of forty projects that have not been made. <laughs> you know, I could probably come up with like, you know, four hundred, five hundred, um, you know, in an hour. Uh, you know, so you could be the first person to make. You know, someone's made a one-string guitar. Um, no one's made a six-string guitar in Music Blocks. You, you know, no one's made a flute. You know, you can make a virtual flute. You know, there's all sorts of things that you can do. And, and we want, you know, you know, it, the kids, right, who are working on this to basically be the ones that invent, you know, and have that sense of like, you know, I had an idea, I didn't know exactly how I was going to get from A to B, you know, I ran into a problem, I got stuck, you know, um, I joined the, you know, our make the Sugar Labs Matrix channel, I, I asked, you know, some of my peers, um, I pub published my work, you know, I got some feedback. Um, you know, one of the, the mentors, you know, on the channel, you know, gave me, uh, you know, did some tweaks and now here, here it is. And I'm the first one to do this. Yes. I don't know what, uh, you just said. <laughs> um, you're welcome to uh, to try and get <laughs> get as far. I, I mean, the answer really is is yes. I mean, it, you know, you might have to get really involved to, to do that. Um, you know, you might find that there's some samples you know, of sounds that you need, you know, but there's ways to add those samples and things like that. So it's interpreted. Yeah. Yeah, this is all JavaScript. It's all. Yeah, you're still waiting. Oh yeah, so um, we're really proud. You know, I, I mentioned that that number. You know, fifty percent of uh, you know patches. You know, um, you know, being made by the kids. Um, uh, this was, screenshot was just taken like yesterday, I think. Um, so this is Music Blocks in particular. You know, two hundred and twenty-one contributors. Um, I was looking at a, a comparable project that's actually been along uh, around longer. You know, and it was like sixty or something. You know, so, you know, we, we certainly like uh, invite, you know, people um, to make, you know, different contributions, you know, however big or small, you know, and we give them credit for it. You know, we allow them to be the ones that get their, their code merged into the, um, into the main code base. Um, yeah, so this is the Q&A time, so. Yeah.
yeah, I, I heard the music block stuff. That's great. I'm happy to show you more. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, I mean, we're just, uh, I, I, I would be hard pressed to repeat the, the specific question for the, the, the stream, but um, uh, he was mentioning that another project had what, 40? 48 contributors, and this is like more than four times, you know, the number of contributors. Basically, we're just very proud to like, you know, we want people to have that, that feeling of, you know, creating something and contributing to something. Um, yeah, so, um, for example, you know, uh, you know, music blocks in particular, I mean, so, yeah, exactly, so, yeah, so, so we made, you know, systemic decisions you know, to use, you know, interpreted languages rather than compiled languages so that, you know, someone can, you know, hack on it and, and get that, you know, feedback, you know, so like the source code itself is like a pedagogical tool. Um, yeah, so yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, in fact, an India who uh, was one of the people featured, um, you know, in the four individual section, um, and I was kind of surprised because in India, um, I thought kind of he, he seemed like a person who knew everything. Um, but uh, you know, when I interviewed him, he did mention that you know one of the reasons he decided to work on uh, on one of our projects instead of another project is you know it was you know the source code was there he was able to. You know, he, he called it vanilla. You know, it was like vanilla code where you could just download it, you know, get clone, blah, 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 and then just start making some changes um, and then just do a quick refresh and then see the result of those changes. Um, and now he's making a TypeScript. So that was a JavaScript uh, version. He's making a TypeScript version, which is a little less accessible, but, you know, he was able to make this transition, you know, from something that was like, you know, Yeah, we're we're always, you know, trying to think of ways to to make it as easy as possible to go from being a user to eventually a contributor. Um, other questions? I'm trying to see if someone who hasn't asked a question has a question. If not, yes. Um, yeah, so he's asking, you know, um, uh, a lot of the contributors, you know, seem like they're on the younger side, you know, how many, you know, uh, you go from being just kind of like a short term, like one time contributor to more long term contributor. I mean, there are a lot of people that come and they just want to do like one or two 
commits and I think uh uh but you know they're those don't always work <laughs> um you know uh so you know we do encourage people that's part of the mentorship process actually you know because some sometimes uh people come in and they they do a pull request and it's like what is this what value does this add you know and we find out well they haven't actually even used the software so we've got to you know explain to them like you know it is really helpful you know when you're contributing to a project you know to actually use it um spend some time you know figuring out what it what it does um and you know at that point they either you know try to find some other project they can do like you know one line of code or they you know follow our advice and they start using it you know and uh i can't i couldn't give you like a percentage you know but um you know there there are a fair amount of people that that stay around and uh because like when you make a a contribution right you you have like a sense of responsibility you know to that um you know whatever you you created and you become like the person responsible for you know you become the expert you know so when there's you know when someone else needs help with that same you know uh, feature or you know repository you know you're the one that you know we want to ask you know and if you're busy you know that that happens too but you know generally we we ask those people and they come back and they you know they answer the question and um yeah so i don't know if i was just going off the top of my head it's like you know maybe like five percent become like longtime contributors but that's like out of hundreds of people so it adds up over time yes That brings me to the last slide. <laughs> um, yeah, your small donation makes a big difference. <laughs> um, so uh, the best way to find um, where to uh, donate is to go to our website, which, by the way, is uh, a big Jekyll site. And so I've had to learn um, <laughs> Jekyll <laughs> in order just to, like, you know, run the website. Um, but if you go to www.sugarlabs.org and you go to the bottom, um, there's a li list of different links and one says, uh, you know, donate, uh, it'll bring you to our wiki page. Um, you can, you know, mail us a check. There's an address where you can do that. Um, you can use, uh, PayPal and we are on the, uh, uh, the PayPal plan or whatever you call it. We're, we're like an approved nonprofit with them where they don't take uh, as much money, if any money, you know, out of the transaction. Um, you can donate through Facebook, but we are at Fossey, and I don't know how many people want to do that. Um, and we'll have more ways of donating in the future, but that's kind of like where we're at right now. Um, I think we're... <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, again, if you have any questions, you can contact me. There's my email address. There's uh, my handle on Mastodon. Um, and that's a JMP number. <laughs> um, so you can text it, call it. And that's the official Sugar Labs number right now. Thank you so much. <laughs>